left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She knew it in her heart. She was trying to convince. Uh, and when it says, um, she went her way into the city and said to the men, you could take that two ways. You could say she said it to the men of the city. But also, I guess you could say that she said to the men that she had been with. Come see this man. I think I found the Messiah. Come check him out. He'll tell you every sin you've ever committed. Now, like I said, if you're right, if you want to be right with God, that won't bother you a bit in the world. And it did clearly did not bother her. She knew she was a sinner, but she knew that she had been forgiven. She knew that God had given her grace through Jesus Christ. And she was excited to tell these men that she had found the Messiah. And uh, verse 30, then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples uh, prayed to him saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat. Here's what keeps me alive. Here's what keeps me going. This is what feeds not my flesh, but this is what feeds my spirit. This is what gives me joy. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he said, um, well, well, we'll we'll read the rest of it here in a little bit in, after we go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would meet the need of everyone that is here and everyone that is with us online. Those who will listen to this uh, long after, Lord, I've preached this message. I pray, Lord, let it be a blessing to someone. And Father, Lord, you know, you know me, Father. I have absolutely nothing to give to these people. I have no wisdom of my own about this situation, about this passage of Scripture I don't have any wonderful ideas. I'm just going to simply leave it up to you, God, to speak to each and every one in such a way, Lord, as they know it's you. They know that it is the Holy Ghost speaking to them, the Holy Ghost dealing with them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, that you would guide them and bless them as they study the word, meditate on the word, ponder the word, think on these things, as Paul told the Philippians. And Father, just fill us and with your word and give us a desire, a hunger and a thirst for the things of your word tonight instead of the things of this world. Father, replace one with the other is what we're asking you to do for us tonight. So, Father, Lord, just bless this message. Bless your people. Bless your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said... Amen. We, we kind of touched on this uh, last week a little bit where he talks about he has um, uh, back in verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him ought to eat. Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And it's just sort of like after you've had a, a good meal, a good satisfying meal, something that just, that just tasted good, it felt good going down, you knew you had something good in your stomach and it blessed you for a long time thereafter. I'll never forget as a young minister when God had uh, finally heard my prayer. Uh, this was back several years before Matthew was born, the girls... Uh, Lisa and I had just got married and we were uh, raising up the, the, my three daughters, the girls. And um, we were married about three years. And I was working in construction. But God just really began to lay... And to be honest with you, I had sort of just taken the idea of being in the ministry and I put it on the back burner. I just kind of set it back aside and I didn't really give it much thought. 
And I know that was for a reason. The qualifications for a bishop, one of the qualifications for a bishop, we brought up the other uh, last Sunday, but one of them is, is that he is to rule his house well. That doesn't mean he's to be the, the total dictator of his house. It means he is to rule over his house and do a good job of it. That means he's to be, he's has, he has to have some maturity. He has to have some wisdom that comes with age and experience. And it means that he has to know how to uh, take care of a wife, take care of a family. And the Bible clearly says, for if a man know not how to take care of his family, how can he take care of the house of God? And that was something that I was missing. I thought I, I wanted right out of Bible college, I wanted to get right into a church. Because I thought then I was going to live the easy life after that. I thought preachers just sat around their desk all day with their feet propped up, taking naps and everything like that. That's what I thought. And God would not let me do that. And for, the, for three years I worked in construction and uh, I learned a trade and started getting better at that trade and better at that trade. And I put the ministry on the back burner. But then God began to burn inside my soul and to make me dissatisfied. And I, re I realized that God was not going to let me completely forsake the ministry. He had called me when I was 16 years old. I knelt at that altar, surrendered to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to do whatever God called me to do. And God was at the point now, it's okay, Mike, you've been married now a few years, you've got a few children on your hands, and... And you're learning what responsibility, you know what it's like to get up out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and go to work. Instead of laying in bed all day, you know what it's like to do a day's work. And I worked at a place where you didn't just stand around leaning on a shovel. You worked, you moved, you got it going, you got it done. And because every time, it seemed like every time we ever took a break, the boss would pull up in his truck. And there we were taking a break. And so anyway... God began to move in me about pastoring a church. And I consulted with my former pastor. I even consulted with the man that I worked for because his testimony was, was turning out similar to mine. And he saw that in me. He did not want me to turn out that way. Because God, as a teenager, had called him to preach many years ago as a teenager. And he said, when I graduate college, I graduate high school, he said, I'm going to go to seminary and, and learn how to be a preacher. Well, he got, he got to working in construction, started making pretty good money, and he said, I'm going to hold off a year, going to seminary, I'm going to build up some money. And after the first year, he had a big pile of money, and he said, I need, to, I need some more, so I'm going to work another year and hold off seminary. After a while, he just forgot about going into the ministry. His first marriage collapsed, it was a mess. He found himself in bars, having bar fights, drinking. Making money hand over fist, doing everything except what the Lord had called him to do. And one night after a skirmish with a man whom he shot, the guy survived. He's sitting in a jail cell and he said, Mike, the devil's sitting on top of me saying, I can make you do whatever I want you to do. And he said, it scared me. He said, I realized I had wasted 20 some odd years of my life that I should have been in the ministry and was not. And he said, Mike, I don't want to see you turn out that way. So if you think God's calling you to go find a church to preach somewhere, if I were you and I were smart, I'd go find that church. Good advice. So I talked to Lisa about it. We began to pray. God sent us to a little church not too far from here in Washington County in Richwoods, Missouri. And we had, a, we had a great time there. But I'll never forget. Here's the gist of this story. I'll never forget. Not too long after I became pastor, I made it a point I was going to go see and visit everybody in the church. Get, get to know them a little bit. Find out where they lived. At least... You know, learn something about them. And I'll never forget leaving a family's house. We'd had a good time. We'd, we'd fellowshiped. We'd done a little Bible study. We had prayed. And on my way back home, I just, tears started going down my eyes. 
And I will never forget that day as long as I live. It's like the Holy Ghost was saying, Mike... Do you now see and understand the joy that comes to your life by serving me? The rewards that you have, the feeling that you have right now of knowing that you're, the, you're in the exact center of my will and you're doing what I am wanting you to do. You do what I tell you to do and, I, and I'll bless that, Mike. And I will never forget that as long as I live. Oh, you young people, those of you here, those of you listen to me online, when you get to a point in life, you've got a choice. You can either walk away from everything you've learned in church all your life and go serve the devil. And if, if God has the grace on you, he might bring you back after you've wasted 20, 30 years of your life, after you've gone out and done all the sins that you, you've wanted to do. If God calls you back. But God doesn't have to. Or you can choose to just go and serve God. And be in the center of God's will. And I'm telling you there is nothing like serving God. Knowing you are in his will. Nothing like. But that's what Jesus said. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. That's where his joy came from. That's where his satisfaction came from. That's where his blessing came from. So I, I remember talking about this, some of this last week. But I just wanted to share that testimony with you. I don't think I've ever really talked about that very much. Over the years that I've been pastoring. But I'll never forget that night driving home. The feeling that I had of knowing that I was serving God and doing what he wanted me to do. He wasn't, God was not then whipping on me about some stupid thing I did. That in itself is priceless, amen. Now, um, go to, um, oh, let's see here. We've already done that. John chapter 4. Let's look at this issue of the harvest. Because Jesus is going to change subjects here for a minute. So he says back in John chapter 4, 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me in to finish his work. Now look at verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Now you know me, I'm a numbers guy. And I don't think it's an accident that Christ spoke this particular number in this passage. And I'm going to share some things with you. I'm going to go off notes tonight because I don't have it in my notes. I'm going to go off notes tonight. But I'm going to share with you just sort of what I think he meant by this. He said, say not, say not ye there yet four months and then cometh harvest. Let me, let me address one situation right away. I read a lot of people's things on the internet, I, and I used to more than I do now. And it seems like everybody's in a hurry to get the rapture to come, take us all home, get us out of here, so we don't have to put up with anything else. There's a hurry, there's... People just saying, oh, I, I want it to happen now. In fact, I believe it is. Oh, we're, oh if that happens, all oh, the rapture is going to happen. Oh, if this happens, the rapture is going to happen. And I think a lot of people are in a hurry for the rapture to happen. But let me tell you something. I can remember as a boy sitting in the pews that you guys are sitting in right now, hearing preachers preach, I believe Jesus will come in my lifetime. And those guys are dead. Those guys are all dead. He did not come in their lifetime. I've heard, I've heard people say that, oh, what, you know, when Israel became a nation in 1947, Jesus talked about this generation shall not pass. Well, a generation's 40 years, so 1987, that's when it's all going to break down. Well, it didn't happen in 1987, did it? So then they changed it. Oh, it must mean this, year 2000. Well, Jesus didn't come in the year 2000. Well, maybe a generation means 
Uh, 70 years. What's 70 years from 1947? Do the math. Huh? 2017. Did he come in 2017? They get it wrong every single time. And one of the things that God did with me years ago is, Mike, don't get into trying to find the day and the hour and the year and all that stuff. Stay away from it. Let everybody else be fools who dare try to figure me out because they're never going to figure it out. And so I stay away from it. You, you never hear me say, I, I believe it's going to happen this year. Oh, I believe with all my heart. I've done the calculations and I've seen... Never heard me say that. Okay? Say not ye there yet four months and then cometh harvest. Look what he said. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. You know what he's saying? Look at the world that you're living in right now. Or is there not work to do now? And when I mean works, I don't, I, you know I don't believe we're saved by works. But I believe that God gives each one of us a calling. Certainly, certainly it falls upon us to labor in God's word. Does it not? Laboring in God's Word means reading it, studying it, memorizing it, meditating on it, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, finding here a little and there a little, and studying your Bible is part of what that means. Laboring in the Word means you study. That means we get together when it's time and we study the Bible together and we learn things from the Word of God. The, it's, you could say, well, I don't see what the, I don't see why we should. The rapture is going to happen at any minute. Jesus said, don't do that. Because you don't know when I'm going to appear in the air. You don't know the day or the hour. So work until it's time and then I will relieve you of the work that you've done and I will bless the work that you've done. But until you see me in the air, keep working. Keep laboring. Somebody say amen. Now he says the yet, he says for there are yet four months. He uses the number four. What does that mean? Well, I always like to say it represents the gospel, Matthew, Mark. Luke and John. And so when it comes to laboring in the word, we are giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're trying to teach them about his birth, his life, his teachings, his death, his burial, his resurrection. The fact that his blood atones for the sins of mankind. Uh, I remember standing in line at Walmart Pharmacy one time. I, I remember the place where we was. And it was right around, right before Easter. And somebody said something about Good Friday. And this young man piped up. He said, what in the world is Good Friday anyway? He asked that question. He probably had never been to church a day in his life. And since nobody piped in and answered, I was standing behind him. And I said, well, sir, let me tell you what it is. It's based upon the idea, and I said, I think they're off a little bit. I said, but it's based upon the idea that it represents the day that Jesus Christ died to pay for the sins that you and I have committed in advance of his resurrection from the dead because Jesus is not still dead. He's alive, and he's at the right hand of the Father, and whoever comes to him calling upon his name, asking forgiveness of their sins. God will forgive their sins. God will bless them and they can have everlasting life. And after hearing me say that, he went, oh, and he turned around. He didn't want no more. Yeah, it was too much. But at least he got that part of it. Amen. Okay. You know what? There was some. Now, I don't know how that man will turn out. 
Those words may ring in his ear for years and he may finally, he may finally find himself a Bible-believing church somewhere and get saved and say, you know, I met a guy one time, told me about Good Friday and I never forgot that. And now I know what it means. Amen. I hope to see him in heaven one of these days. We still have work. We still have labor to do. And by the way, there are yet four months. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. The harvest. I want you to think about this for a minute. Let's say that, let's say that we are all farmers. Let's say that all of us here are what our forefathers were in this country. We're all farmers. Where, do we, where does our income come from? Huh? The crops. Do we have crop insurance? Did they have crop insurance 150 years ago? Nope. So if you lost a crop, more than likely you starved to death. That crop was everything to you. Is there a battle to fight over the harvest? Yes. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Jesus said there, say not ye there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. And there are enemies who would love to destroy our fields, our crops. One of David's mighty men, the Bible says, met the Philistines in a field that was full of lentils. Lentils was uh, just, like, just like in Kenya. One of the staples that they eat over there is maize. It's corn. And I've seen places in Kenya where literally every square inch of dirt had corn stalks growing on it. I mean in the front yard backyard, everywhere, you name it, they were growing maize, they were growing corn. Why? Because they knew that, that once it came in, it would hold them for a year. And if something happened to that, those people were going to starve to death. Well, up in Turkana, the reason why we're having to feed so many people up there is that they've had two locust plagues up there. Locusts are a type of what you see in Revelation 9. They're a type of principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. And I'm telling you, the devil is going after your crops. He's going after your harvest. He's going after your future. Listen to that. He is trying to destroy what is coming, what God has blessed, and what, God, what blessings God will give you in the future. He's trying to destroy that. Should you just roll over and let him do it? Absolutely not. That David's mighty, that mighty man of David stood there in that field full of lentils, knowing what those lentils meant to the people who owned that field. That was their livelihood for the next year. And if the Philistines took it over, they were going to starve to death and die. And that one man, that one man stood there. In that field of lentils and fought off every one of them stinking Philistines. And he said, this is not your ground. Get off of it. And he killed every one of them that tried it. That's our work, people. That's our work. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Um, let's see here. Verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now all of you with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, listen to this.
marriage and the conception of children is essentially sowing seed. It is. Just like you planting beans, just like you planting tomatoes, just like you planting okra, just like you planting whatever it is you planted, it's a marriage and the production of children in that marriage. You're waiting for the harvest. You know what the harvest is? Is when those children grow up to find Jesus in their life, call upon him to be their savior and they grow up as Christian young men and women still serving the Lord. And you ponder that for a long time. Another par verse 24, he put forth a parable unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. When we raise our children in church, when we bring them to the house of God, when we... Uh, allow them to be taught the word of God or when we as parents teach them ourselves the word of God what are we doing we're sowing good seed in their life now think about it verse 25 but while men slept his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way does the devil try to sow corrupt ideas into your children's minds You better believe it. Think of the music that they listen to. It's been a long time. I, I, when, when I was in my 20s, in Bible college, I used to go to churches and do exposés on rock music to churches. Pastors would invite me and I had lyrics and I had examples and and I would try to I would try to show teenagers and parents and church members what was in the songs that their children were listening to. And I knew another guy in the ministry that did that. In fact, he came here. This has been years ago. And I, I asked him, I said, his name was David Benoit. And I said, Dave, don't. Do you still do uh, deals, exposés on rock music? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, number one, the lyrics have gotten so vulgar. He said, I can't even, I can't even say what it is these songs are saying because they're so vulgar. Number two, most of that music is in their worship service. And he said, so nobody asked me to do it anymore. He's telling the truth. But when you raise children or grandchildren, great grandchildren, whatever it is. You're trying to sow good seed into their life, teaching them morals, values, teaching them Bible verses, teaching them the ways of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. And yet there's the devil trying to sow corrupt seed into their life. That's your, that's your field. And I'm going to tell you something. You're going to harvest out of that field whatever seed prevails in that field. You're going, to har you're going to harvest it. What does the Bible say? Be not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is not mocked, is he? So he said in verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field from whence then it hath it tares? He said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And that's what Jesus, he's talking about the harvest. Until the harvest. Now, tell me, explain to me what happens. How does an apple farmer know that the apples are ready to be picked? How does an apple farmer know this? 
Yes, Caleb. They turn red. Huh? Let's it's a Granny Smith. It didn't take me long going to Eckert's first time we ever went peach picking. And I made myself so sick. They had to literally help me up into that cart. That wagon to haul me out of there. I ate pears or, or peaches until I just couldn't. They was, oh, I couldn't. I had, I had handfuls of them going, I can't eat another one. But it didn't take me long to figure out. All you had to do is just barely touch them. And when you felt that softness, man, they were ripe. And you've got peach juice running all down your neck, into your shirt and everything like that. Well, I'm just going, I'm in heaven. Okay, they went at harvest. There is a transformation. You've seen what I've taught on this. In the case of the wheat and the tares, they both start out green as grass. And you can just barely, if you know what to look for, you can tell the difference. But other than that, you really can't. They're just as green as grass. Both of them are. But at harvest, there is a transformation. There is a change that takes place. And let me tell you something. When someone gets really right with God, there is a change that takes place. Amen to that. Now, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's tie it in with this. 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn there. Not Revelation, Mike. 1 Peter. Chapter 1. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The Southern Baptist Convention had their annual meeting this last week. And I read the tweets of some of the people that I follow on Twitter, like in Southern Gospel Music that belong to the Southern Baptist Convention. And they just stood and shook their heads at the things that they heard coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention. How the Southern Baptist Convention ought to be more open to sodomites and to the sodomite issue and to transgenderism and all this kind of nonsense, critical race theory and all this kind of nonsense that's going around. And one guy said, here we are, we're supposed to be churches that are preaching the gospel. And now we care more about allowing people to live and remain in their sin than try to preach to them so that they can leave their sin and have eternal life. But that's what's going on. And it's happening in every denomination. It's happening in, in every ministry, everywhere, around the world. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus said it himself. Good seed cannot produce corrupt fruit, neither can corrupt seed produce good fruit. It is absolutely impossible for that to happen. And I'm going to say to everybody, I'm going to say it to the adults, and I'm going to say it to the young people who are both here and listening online. When you fill your mind with corrupt seed, by television, by internet, by social media, by the radio. I don't know who listens to the radio anymore. By radio, by iTunes, by the, by the music. When you sow that into your mind, that is what you become. Brother Ed Bell, I'll never forget what he said. Right after, what was that, Michael Brown shooting. That Michael Brown went after that cop. That cop warned him several times. He had no choice but to defend himself and he shot him. 
And I really wasn't looking for anything like that. But one Sunday, not, one Sunday morning, not too long after that, I asked him, anybody's got any testimony? And Ed stood up and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I live in Ferguson. He said, I live, that's my people. And he said, I can tell you, they are taught from the youngest age to hate white people, to hate cops, to hate the law, to hate the white man's law. They're taught that by their parents. They're taught that by their school teacher. And they're taught that by the music that they grew up in. And he said, I don't let my boys listen to that kind of music. He said, they're taught that from the earliest age possible. He said, that is exactly what got Michael Brown killed. And I'm just going. But he said it because he knew it was true. When you sow corrupt seed into your life or allow it to be sowed into your life or allow it to be sowed into your family or into your children or into your grandchildren or into your church or into your nation, I guarantee you there's a harvest coming. There is a harvest coming. And if we go back to Matthew chapter 13, we find out how God deals with the corrupt seed, the tares, the poison darnel. He says in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 13, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The wheat is God's saints. The tares are the children of the wicked one. They're the ones who listened to the lyrics of the songs. They're the ones who, who followed after the TV stars, the movie stars. They're the ones who followed the comic books. They're the ones who followed the liberal professors in school. They're the ones who followed the crowd. They followed the ways of this world. They allowed their minds to be sowed with corruptible seed. And when you have corruptible seed sowed into your mind, you will bring forth a harvest of nothing but pure corruption. I can't say it any better than that. I can't say it any plainer than that. God says it as plain as it can be, and I'm going to repeat it. Whatsoever, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You cannot feed off of this world and the things of this world and then come into the house of God two times a week, one time a week, three times a week. And have what little that I try to give you each and every time. At some point you're going to have to throw out the bad seed. And root up what's been sown in there. And sow good seed into your mind and into your heart. Or you'll turn out just like the rest. You're going to turn out like Kamala Harris for crying out loud. What's wrong with you? It's after 8 o'clock. But uh, that's, that's, I've got more here, but I'm going to stop there. Adults, pay attention to what you're watching, who you're following, who you're listening to, what you're listening to. And... I'm going to say this and it's going to sound self-serving. And I don't intend it to be. But I used to have a guy that would call here and he, every time he called, he always chewed me out for something. And I, I let him talk. He called here about three or four times and I, and I let him. I just tried to bite my tongue. I let him do it. But he always compared me with other preachers that he watched online. And I finally said, sir, I want to make a suggestion to you. 
I said, I'm going to suggest to you that you pick one pastor. One preacher. If you, don't, if you can't find a church anywhere in your area to go to. And you're going to choose these online preachers. I'm going to suggest to you that you pick one and listen to him and quit listening to all the others. I said, because you sitting here now, every time you call me, you constantly compare me to what the other preachers that you've listened to have said to try to prove how wrong I am on certain things. And I said, I, number one, I don't have time for this. And I said, just find one and listen to them and pick one. And he said, well, you sound kind of hateful today. You got a mean streak in you, brother. You got a problem. And I said, sir, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend any more time with you. I love you, but I'm not going to sit here and, and, and allow you to tear me up one side down the other based upon what you heard other preachers on the internet preach. Pick you a pastor, stay with one of them. Because you can't have four heads running your life telling you what to do. And I want to encourage each and every one of you. And, I, and I'm not saying that you got to pick me. I told him that specifically. And I said, and, and it, if it's not me, that's fine. There's some other good preachers out there. But I, if I were you, I'd pick one of them. No man can serve two masters. The Bible's obvious on that. Find one of them and listen to them. And if I'm ever wrong about something, and you think I am wrong about something concerning the Word of God, take it to the Word of God, take it to God, pray for me, let God deal with me, let God handle, let God handle me. I guarantee you, God will handle me, God will change me. He already has with a lot of things, and He's going to keep doing it. But find you one. Don't let somebody sow corrupt seed into your heart and into your life and into your mind. Because you will not like the harvest when it comes.